Well, super. Well, it's uh, 632, so we'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, my name is Scott Anderson. I'm the co-owner, along with my wife, Dr. Nicole Anderson of Artisan Dental in Madison, Wisconsin. And we'd like to welcome you to the webinar uh, titled The Carbon Neutral Dental Office. We're really um, heartened and delighted that you're here to learn more about um, carbon management um, in your dental practice or perhaps your dental institution. Um, I did see that there's a, a student or a faculty member from Marquette University joining us. Um, so thank you very much. Um, hi, Carolyn. <laughs> and in terms of the format for tonight, um, we kind of broke the program into two halves. The first 30 minutes will provide kind of an overview of Artisan's case and then Olivia a uh, few sell from Carbon Credit Capital. We'll talk more about the services they provide companies uh, in terms of managing their carbon. And then Robert Banner from Green Trees will uh, provide an overview of the myriad benefits associated with reforestation um, for a variety of stakeholders. We want to encourage you to um, ask questions in the chat function. And then also the last 30 minutes of the program will just be an open forum for um, you to ask questions to each other or to the speakers. Um, so we hope it's really value adding uh, for you overall. Um, lastly, I wanna share that this is being recorded and the intent there is that we'll post the webinar to the Wisconsin Dental Association's website and then we'll also post it to the Artisan Dental YouTube channel. And we hope that this becomes an enduring resource for everyone in the dental community around the world. Um, because when I went on to YouTube and just uh, searched for you know, carbon neutral dental practices, there's really no content on YouTube around this subject matter. So hopefully it will serve as a resource uh, for others. Um, so, um, before we begin, I wanted to just give you some uh, background on both Olivia and Robert. Uh, Olivia, Olivia founded Carbon Credit Capital in 2006. She's an energy and environmental leader with a 15-year history of dedication and insight on global environmental policy, as well as expertise in carbon finance, carbon offsets, and corporate sustainability. Her ambition is to lead more and more small and medium businesses to be carbon neutral. And Robert Banner joined Acre Investment Management three years ago as a senior project officer. As the parent company of both Green Trees and Conservation Plus, Acre and Rob are committed to the marriage of commerce and conservation. By growing trees for carbon and nutrient credits, their business delivers rewards for all landowners who want to use their property to heal the earth. As a result, Green Trees has become the largest reforestation project in the world by credit issuance, carbon credit issuance, and it manages more than 120,000 acres, growing 42 million trees. In his spare time, Rob is an accomplished equestrian. So super. So Thanks, in yeah, mm -hmm. you're welcome. So in, ter in terms of the uh, agenda, I'll cover um, our experience of, uh, on our way to becoming carbon neutral and the benefits that we see for the stakeholders we serve. Uh, Olivia will go in depth on how a company can become carbon neutral. And then again, Robert will talk about um, where do carbon offset credits come from and talk about trees as really the best carbon removal technology uh, available. And then again, open it up for your questions and answers. And I see uh, another person is joining the conference, so I'll just let them in. And off we'll go. So Artisan Dental is a general dentistry practice in Madison, Wisconsin. We have 23 team members and four dentists. We're a mission, vision, and values-oriented business. Um, and are a participant in the wider business for good movement. Um, some of those sub movements include uh, being a certified B corporation, which, whose logo you can see, and then also being a 1% for the planet member. So why did Artisan become carbon neutral? By mission, we intend to serve five different stakeholder groups, our patients, our team members, 
our suppliers and contractors, the community, and then we consider the environment as our fifth big stakeholder group. We feel we have a responsibility to steward the environment. We've also recognized that climate change is one of the most significant threats to ecosystem stability, and also appreciate that a balanced ecosystem supports life, it supports the economy that we participate in, and therefore it supports really the whole dental industry. Um, and we also felt like becoming carbon neutral gave us an opportunity to demonstrate deeper value alignment with our patients and our team members. And then as you'll see, um, we really feel that these types of initiatives can help us attract and retain patients, as well as attract and retain the best and brightest uh, team members. So in terms of our journey, um, we started uh, the practice in 2014 with uh, simple things that we can do to conserve energy, everything from Energy Star appliances to uh, compact fluorescent lighting. In 2015, we decided to purchase 100% of our electricity from renewable sources. Uh, and in our particular case, we purchased that renewable energy from Madison Gas and Electric. And in just that single choice, we reduced our carbon footprint by 83%. So that's a, a good example of low hanging fruit and something that you could do tomorrow in your practice or institution to markedly reduce your carbon footprint. In 2018, we started offering our team, our team members an alternative transportation subsidy of $1 a day. So for every day that maybe they drove an electric vehicle, maybe they took public transit, or perhaps uh, they walked to work or rode their bike, we offered them a dollar remuneration. Then in 2019, we decided to become carbon neutral and we began working with carbon credit capital to start measuring our carbon footprint. And then in 2020, um, after understanding what our carbon footprint was through the analysis that carbon credit capital did, we um, then went forward and purchased carbon credits from green trees. So in the next couple of slides, I'd like to share with you um, some global research that really suggests there's a shift happening in what consumers are looking for, what team members are looking for, and also what leaders are doing in terms of the direction they're taking their companies that really support the idea that um, customers and team members are looking for businesses to do something beyond just provide a product or service. They really want businesses, institutions to have a positive impact in the world. So the first um, study was done by Accenture, uh, a well-regarded um, consultancy here in the States. And in 2018, they surveyed almost 30,000 consumers across 25 different countries around the world. And they found that beyond price and quality, what consumers were looking for is they're looking for a company to demonstrate that it has a purpose, for it to be transparent in its actions, and that it's looking to align at the level of core beliefs or core values. 52% of those people surveyed said that they're attracted to brands that stand for something beyond just its product or service. And that now the brand that a company has really is a reflection of how all of the different stakeholders view that particular brand. So it's really more of a community perception. The second study uh, around the notion that um, consumers are looking to buy for good comes from uh, this study done by Cone Communications, looking at 9 million consumers in nine countries. And they showed that more than nine out of 10 would think positively about a company if they were addressing a social or environmental issue. Nine out of 10 expect companies to do more than make a product. And these next two metrics, I think, are especially important in the field of dentistry, which is really a, a field that rests a, a lot on the trust that we develop with our patients. And that is 90% of people said that they would trust a company more if they knew that the company was truly addressing a social or environmental issue, in addition to being more likely to be loyal over time. And interestingly, the bottom metric suggests there's some pricing power for companies who are having a social or environmental impact that 
consumers are saying they're actually willing to pay a little bit more for a product or service. So this slide looks at the perception of employees. This was done by Hewlett Packard. It was a workforce sustainability survey looking at 10,000 citizens across 10 countries. And employees felt that sustainability, six, six out of 10 felt that sustainability is mandatory. Almost six out of 10 felt that environmentally conscious practices are key to engaging a workforce. Almost half felt that top talent will only work for companies with sustainability practices. And again, almost half felt that sustainability is a major factor when choosing a company to work for. The next slide um, was sponsored by the United Nations Global Compact. Uh, Accenture, Accenture uh, consultancy facilitated it. And it looked at the perceptions of a thousand different CEOs across 27 different industries. And almost eight out of the, those 10 CEOs said that brand, trust, and reputation of their company drives them to act on sustainability. Eight out of 10 said that a commitment to a societal purpose is a differentiator in their industry. So they see it as a competitive advantage. And that 97% uh, said that sustainability is important to future success of their business. And the last slide that I'll show you, I think is, is very compelling. This was done by Hamburg University in Germany in collaboration with Deutsche Bank. And it was published in the Journal of Sustainable Finance and Investment. And they looked at the link between, is a company a good steward? So do they have programs that are caring for the environment? Are they socially responsible? Do they have good governance practices? And for those companies that do, they actually were shown to have stronger financial performance. So this really addresses the concern that some people have that if a company is doing good, if they're having a broader impact, isn't that going to have a negative effect on their financial performance? And this study was a meta-analysis of over 2,200 academic studies dating all the way back to the early 70s, showing that in every single region of the world, there was a strong correlation between a company's social responsibility and their financial performance. So, sort of taking that and then thinking about how the consumers' perceptions are changing, team members' perceptions are changing, leaders' perceptions are changing. When thinking about carbon, what were some easy carbon reduction strategies that we could all employ? The, the first is um, increasing energy efficiency of existing equipment or perhaps new equipment that you're going to purchase. And um, looking at things like insulation that help us just use less energy and have less carbon created. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, if you just switched your electricity over to 100% renewable electricity, you could have a significant impact on your carbon footprint. Um, we've gone with our suppliers to asking them to ship larger quantities of material in fewer shipments. Um, and then increasingly suppliers are often offering carbon neutral shipping. So if, you, if you're interested in perhaps um, engaging carbon reduction strategies that require a little bit more effort, um, you could partner with an organization like Carbon Credit Capital to measure your carbon footprint. Then you could choose to offset all or a portion of that carbon footprint. Um, you might also use this, and we'll talk about kind of the, the marketing public relations opportunities as a way to educate your team and patients on low carbon living. Um, and then uh, a fourth option is offering alternative transportation subsidies to your employees. So you might be asking yourself, what's actually involved in this carbon measurement process? Uh, so when we looked at the process, we recognized that we didn't have the expertise um, within our organization to be able to manage that. So we looked for a partner and uh, Carbon Credit Capital is also a certified, certi excuse me, certified B Corporation like we are. And they offered really a, a very simple one, two, three process that was turnkey. So what that looks like in practice is Carbon Credit Capital sent us a spreadsheet and they asked us to input in 
All of our travel, for example, to a continuing education uh, credits, they ask us to input all of our energy usage and then also list all of the products that we use from office products to consumable products, where we um, order them from and also the sort of location of the manufacturer. And they have sophisticated software that can then translate that information into actual carbon uh, impact down to the product level. And then they tabulate all of that information and summarize it into basically your carbon footprint. So you can see this, an example of the spreadsheet here. And then this summary that reads total emissions and offsetting costs. This is actually Artisan Dental's carbon footprint. So our footprint is almost 12 metric tons. And then this was the cost for offsetting. So I also want to share that there's significant benefits to becoming carbon neutral for your organization and give you now a couple of examples of how we've translated that to build our brand as an organization and build goodwill amongst our stakeholders. So you can see in this particular example, we in the upper right corner, we took our Artisan Dental logo and then we kind of wrapped it with a carbon neutral logo to sort of integrate those benefits. At the bottom of the slide here is a snapshot of the footer from our website. So at the bottom of our website, we list all of our professional dental affiliations. But then on the right-hand side, you can see we list all of our sustainability affiliations. And Carbon Credit Capital uh, was kind enough to actually craft this logo for us in a customized way. Um, so we can share with patients and other stakeholders that we've become a carbon neutral company. There's also, there were also other kind of unexpected opportunities to create uh, goodwill uh, to build our brand. For example, the Dane County Office of Energy and Climate Change started offering awards to what they termed climate champions. So last year, we were designated as a climate champion, um, which created lots of good sort of publicity for artists and out through the Dane County networks. Um, and of course, on LinkedIn, when they post on LinkedIn, and we actually just learned yesterday that we earned a climate champion status for this year as well. On the right hand side of the slide here is just an illustration of the fact that uh, a nonprofit in town called Sustain Dane um, they invited us to speak on a panel discussion earlier in the year on pathways to carbon neutrality. So these are all sort of additional ways that by looking at carbon neutrality, you can put your practice or your institution in a, in a favorable light in various networks in your community. Um, this is just an example of how we told our story that we became the first carbon neutral general dentistry practice in the US on a uh, social media feed. This is uh, an example of our carbon neutral web page on our website. I actually just cut the website in half. So on the left side, you see the top of the web page, and on the right side, you see the bottom of the web page. And we actually chose to also tie our carbon neutrality to some of the sustainable development goals. You can see the uh, cubes at the bottom of the text talk about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals there, 3, 8, 13, 14, and 15. And then you can see at the very bottom of the website is that footer that I talked about earlier with professional affiliations and sustainability affiliations. So at this time, um, I'd like to turn the discussion over to Olivia with Carbon Credit Capital. Good evening, everybody. Um, this particular area, I think, is very, very interesting um, because what we we have a, a rather unique program, we call it, which is to make it as stress free and as easy for individuals and companies to become carbon neutral and in their way fight their little piece of climate change by supporting projects that reduce, avoid or destroy 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. Um, we do this through projects that we support that produce the credits and carbon credit capital does have the highest quality carbon credits for sale. And we, we, um, we do a lot of due diligence to locate the credits. Um, so in Artisan Dental's um, stage, they brought they bought them from, from um, I've forgotten the name of the company now, but he's with us today. And um, for, for we, we represent clients in Brazil, USA, China, and India who produce the credits. So our program, Carbon Neutral Checkout, helps one mitigate 100% of the greenhouse gas emissions associated with a company's products and services on every sale that you make. Um, being carbon neutral, um, next slide, please. Uh, being carbon neutral means that your company eliminates as much greenhouse gas, gas as it creates. Um, next slide, please. So like um, Scott, um, we did do some research and we found that we found a good report, um, which is current still from the National Renewable Energy Lab. And um, it showed that 88% um, of consumers prefer carbon neutral products and services. And uh, with investors, these are very large numbers, um, 32 trillion um, are committed to a low carbon transition. I think we'll call it a transition because that's going to take a very long time. And then with businesses, more and more companies set goals to reduce carbon emissions or aim to in achieve carbon neutrality. This has been, um, this has, um, this there's been a lot of commitments on net zero after the um, up to and after the COP26 that just took place in Glasgow. So um, carbon carbon neutrality is matter matters more and more, I think, to companies. So as Scott refer as Scott mentioned, we try to make it very simple. Um, not so, sim not so simple that it's not accurate, but um, we have to measure uh, scopes, what we call scopes one, two, and three emissions. And this depends on phasing and also depends on the profile of the business. In the case of, um, Scott went through, in the case of the dental practice, what we focused on, but, um, Generally, I'll just give you a quick overview. Um, scope one is uh, basically a company's facilities in which they operate and their transport. Scope two is um, purchased electricity. And scope three is the, is the more comp complicated aspect of carbon accounting because it, it means it includes upstream and downstream which is business travel, waste from operations, transport and distribution, and purchase goods and services. So step one is collecting the data. And we try to make it as straightforward as we can by assisting you in, um, if, um, if the data, for example, if the data does not exist, we um, ask enough questions which are not complicated to make to make up a, a medium um, number. And then um, step uh, four is offsetting and um, purchasing the carbon offsets to mitigate your emissions. Um, next slide, please. So this is really just saying that um, you can really, you can really drive impact. And as Scott mentioned, st stakeholders really care about it. You can address investor policy and market pressures. 
um, verifiably calculate and reduce emissions, authentically integrate CSR marketing strategies. Other than greenhouse gas emission reductions, each carbon offset project has, and Scott referred to this, multiple co-benefits that can be measured and um, are measured particularly by the standards that, and I won't go into all the, standard, the standards that exist, but that um, hold the credits. Um, but um, we can certainly follow up with a bit more detail on that. And in um, conclusion, um, next slide, please. Uh, growth and impact all flow together. The sale of carbon neutral products and services fund projects, that's what I've been referring to, that create the co-benefits and create the carbon credits. The co-benefits are attributed to your brand through public retirement. We retire every credit that is purchased on a quarterly basis or on an annual basis. And um, public, Scott referred to this as well, public transparency drives goodwill and brand value to increase uh, sales. So um, that's, that's where we stand with um, carbon accounting at Carbon Credit Capital. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Robert Banner uh, with Green Trees and Acre Investment Management. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, good work. Uh, nice uh, um, uh, course in, uh, in this emerging market. Um, and uh, I can tell you that, um, uh, that if you're listening and you're learning, you couldn't be involved at a, a more important time uh, to be involved. Um, I, I think this summer, it finally touched just about everybody. One in three Americans suffered from some extreme weather event this summer. So um, maybe it was floods, maybe it was uh, wind from hurricane, uh, maybe it was fire out west or even drought in the southwest. But more and more um, people are beginning to learn that climate change is real, it's getting worse and it's coming to affect them and will continue to affect them. That's more than 100 million people suffered some effects. So the numbers that Scott spoke towards um, will only get um, more pronounced as people realize we have to do more. Um, and this is maybe the best thing that they can do uh, is to play a role in uh, their own carbon footprint. So um, Scott's work is indicative of a responsible business owner in today's world, uh, because um, uh, you know uh, people do do what they they can to reduce their carbon footprint, and if they can't do that, then uh, if they can't be greener, then they can at least buy greener. So they're spending their money um, on businesses that perform to the standard that, that they would like to see the world become uh, as well. Um, they uh, are even offsetting their own personal carbon footprint. So we're seeing this trend really gallop on uh, gather speed and traction and um, the uh, as a result, um, the demand for carbon offsets has mushroomed. And um, you can imagine that there, there aren't many ways to uh, create a carbon credit. We do it through growing trees, but there um, are, are just, it's just a set inventory that's out there. And um, uh, we sell to a lot of people, um, including many Fortune 500 companies like Shell or uh, Norfolk Southern Railway or United Airlines. Um, but when they're gone, they're gone. And at that point, then the uh, demand will drive the price. And uh, at this point, the demand is um, waiting to mushroom. The people learning that they have to do more are realizing that maybe the best thing that they can do after reducing their footprint is to remove carbon from the atmosphere because it's one thing to stop producing carbon, but then what do you do with all the carbon that's still in the air? So um, you have to uh, deal with that somehow. Trees, we feel, 
uh, are the best answer. Um, uh, God bless the people that founded this company um, in 2003 because they had the vision that carbon credits would in fact one day be valuable and that trees would be the answer and they began growing trees then. So now 15 years later, we're looking at trees um, that are more than 60, 65 feet tall. And um, when you start talking about 42 million trees uh, doing their job to photosynthesize the carbon dioxide in the air, holding the carbon in the trunk and releasing the oxygen into the atmosphere, you begin to see that this is a really simple technology. Um, there are a couple of other carbon removal technologies out there. I'm sure you've heard them all in the press, but none of them are operating at the same efficiency as a simple tree. So that's why uh, we have uh, uh, more than 120,000 acres under management growing 42 million trees. And we want to multiply that times 10. Uh, we're primarily in the Mississippi, uh, Louisiana and Arkansas Delta. Uh, because that's where things grow very quickly and we like the trees to grow as quickly as they possibly can. But we're moving um, uh, with equal speed into South Carolina and Virginia. Um, the credits come, you might ask, from measuring the trunks of trees and their growth as they grow older. Uh, so measuring the girth of the tree at the basal area, that's um, the, the, the trunk up to about chest high. Uh, gives you a sense of how much carbon has been stored in that tree in that tree during its lifetime. Now, to certify that these credits are created um, authentically, we um, have to use an independent third-party firm called um, American Carbon Registry, and they send out their own people to measure the trees on a track-by-track -track basis, so that the uh, the measurement of their growth is very accurate and done by someone without conflict so that you know when you're buying a, a carbon offset you're buying one that has been produced uh, legitimately and then um, it has been done uh, domestically we, we we feel that domestic pro projects are the best because the rule of law here in the United States may uh, outperform that in other countries where we just can't count on the way things get done um, so we're happy to keep most of our projects here in the US. So when you buy a credit um, that's been generated by a Green Trees project, you're buying a certified serialized uh, um, a credit that is officially retired uh, when it has been sold uh, and that you have, you have owned a piece of the effort to solve um, climate change by reforestation uh, and um, uh, so the, the beauty of our program is that all of these landowners are aggregated together so that the mass of carbon that we create on seven acres joins that with that we, we produce with a thousand acres. So even the guy with seven acres gets the same price for his carbon offset as the large um, landowner does. Uh, as well, you might say, well, Rob, you're taking a valuable farmland out of production to grow trees. And yes, that may be true, but we really aim for the, uh, for the land that is underproductive, uh, that's often flooded or unproductive for the farmer in soy or corn or, or um, whatever crop um, they're producing. So we know that we're really making the best use of the land. Uh, now, um, think of the tree from the ground up and the leaves doing their job through photosynthesis. Think of what it, e it also does through the root structure that is in the ground and that performs a filter of the um, agricultural runoff that goes through the ground and into the river system. So it's doing two jobs actually. Uh, one is to uh, uh, pull the carbon out of the air and the other is to filter the nutrient Pollution is what they call them. This is just the over fertilization of fields uh, before it gets to the river system and then out to the Gulf of Mexico or the Chesapeake Bay, where it becomes that uh, that um, that loathsome dead um, dead spot that uh, is without oxygen. So we also have um, another company with Green Trees 
that does um, all ecological credits. So not just carbon credits, but nutrient credits, stream restoration credits. Um, uh, there's a whole series of ecological rights <clears throat> that the land maintains, uh, um, even if it's under a conservation easement. So um, your land has become much more valuable as a factory for, for um, curing the world's ills. So um, that's green trees and what we do under the parent company, Acre. And um, uh, of course, if anybody um, uh, needs to reach out for the detail on that, please feel free to call me um, uh, uh, or um, uh, email me. I think the email is, um, is promoted in this, um, in this PowerPoint. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, we're or just uh, right at almost the, a little bit past the halfway point. So we now just wanted to open it up for your, your questions for the panelists, or if you know one of the participants is doing something interesting, feel free to ask a question to one of the participants as well. So the floor is really yours, everyone. And I'll, I'll also check the question in the chat here. Oh, it's a compliment. So thanks, Jerry. Oops. <clears throat> any, any general questions or thoughts that you may have? Plans that you may have that you want to consider? Uh, please, James. Yeah, I, Scott, talked about your dental office and how much preventative dentistry and quality in dentistry comes into play in this. You've got a large staff working on um, full scope of their licensure. That's a big part of preventative of sustainability is doing less dentistry, basically. We want the patients um, healthy and, and not doing and redoing a lot of dentistry, correct? I think that's a great point, James, and, and I think this was the conclusion of the FDI World Federation of Dentistry that the most sustainable form of dentistry is preventive dentistry such that um, there's a reduction in disease and a reduction in overall utilization. So I think that's excellent. And then all of the um, associated benefits for overall systemic health. Yeah, thank you for mentioning the FDI. I serve on the dental practice of the FDI, and we've got a large project going on in sustainability right now and developing a consensus statement with a lot of stakeholders. So uh, watch the website for future developments on that, please. So thank you for your leadership, James. And I want to also share for everyone listening that James and a, a colleague in England have put together a CE uh, based webinar on sustainability and dentistry. So I would encourage you to um, consider that. And in addition, um, Beverly Oviedo is on the call. Um, and Beverly recently published a book called The Sustainable Dentist, um, which is available uh, at the same website. I believe, Beverly, it's sustainabledentist.com. She may chime in here. And I, and that's, I also that's correct, Scott. Excellent. I also want to acknowledge Beverly's work developing ASTM standards on sustainability. And, and Beverly is also working um, with the FDI on a whole new set of standards that will really help dental practices with implementing sustainability initiatives. Um, so I'm really excited about that as well. Um, and this also, I want to give another shout out to Beverly. She had the vision to create the world's first conference on sustainability and dentistry in Iceland uh, back in, I think it was 2019, Beverly? 8, 2018. 2018. And then the last resource that I want to mention that is spectacular that Beverly was also influential in um, creating is the American, uh, the Journal of the American College of Dentists did a whole issue on sustainability in dentistry. And that was the fall of 2018, Beverly? Yes, uh-huh. The fall of 2018, and, and that is, uh, it's a superb piece. Thank you very much, Scott, for your comments. Uh, you've done a tremendous job of bringing individuals together to help engage the dental industry and 
you know, I look forward to seeing that blossom in the future. Yeah, I do too. Uh, Scott, I'd like to um, add that um, before I came, um, I was a customer uh, and I actually did a land um, uh, deal with this company um, uh, in order to raise money for a 501c3 that I was working with. And um, when I reported that um, uh, in the newsletter that we had done a, um, a tree deal with, um, with Green Trees and, um, and Conservation Plus, um, donations improved um, uh, dramatically. People uh, wrote in um, actively applauding the fact that we had done this and sending in contributions as a result. So um, I, I just, I had to uh, say, I'm, I've got to join you guys. So I did. But mm -hmm. <laughs> I would think that in your own practices, you'll see the same support fueled by those who really want to do their best to, or can, want to try and do their best to, to solve things. That's, I, I, I never knew that, Robert. That's really interesting to hear you share that. So these same principles are operative in a nonprofit setting in terms of, you know, the donor stakeholder. <clears throat> well, we, um, we see it um, uh, with the companies that would like to um, offset their own very large missions. Um, uh, uh, Shell, no secret, very large Fortune 500 company. And they buy uh, a lot of um, carbon uh, offsets from us. And um, but like many on Wall Street, those stocks uh, are um, uh, vetted by how well uh, their managers uh, uh, perform in carbon neutrality. So they they have to maintain a certain pace towards this goal. Um, and if they don't, then um, their stock prices will take a dive. They actually say that, um, that they see an uptick when they announce that, um, that they have um, purchased more offsets uh, from us. So, um, so it, it definitely has a positive um, uh, effect on your customer and it will um, hopefully bring them to the door. Yeah. Uh, I can just uh, footnote what Robert is saying in terms of the fact that back in 2015 and 16, when we just chose to purchase renewable energy, we created an eight and a half by 11 little flyer in our office. And we just put it in those clear plastic holders that will sit on the operatory counters. We also have an iPad bar in the waiting room, our front desk. We put those up there. And the, the fact card said, your, your care powered by the wind and the sun. And we had a picture of a solar panel and a picture of a wind turbine. And you know we put the Madison Gas and Electric logo and the Green Power logo. And we even had a customer write in a Google online review. You know They talked about the quality of care first, but then they said it's kind of a last sentence. And I love the fact that they're using renewable energy. So this is a kind of a direct illustration of what Robert is talking about in the form of a patient review, which from our perspective then has enduring marketing value um, and probably more credible marketing value because it's coming from a direct patient experience. Yeah, I think it, uh, this is a uh, carbon credit capital, Olivia. I think um, the, the action of um, becoming carbon neutral certainly does affect the customers. Um, we offset um, several food companies and um, because we've been doing it for quite a long time, we find there is a direct correlation between the volume has steadily increased and that um, the carbon neutrality um, mark has has helped improve the brand and sell more product. So I'm just I'm just noticing there's a couple more chats. I'll just check and see if there's a question there. Okay, so Sarah is asking, uh, what other carbon offset methods are there besides using trees? Olivia, do you want to take that or Robert? 
Yes, I can take that. Um, there, there are many, and um, they're, they're all pretty well articulated within the standards when you create a carbon credit project. Um, so in, in certain countries, you can offset with renewable energy, um, primarily wind and solar. Um, we can, we have um, in the way of other sequestration other than trees, it's um, the, this carbon sequestration into um, beginning now into um, disused oil, oil and gas wells. Um, there's methane reduction on um, for for um, agricultural agriculture. Um, there is um, also methane reduction on landfills. Um, we're working on a number of, of projects that uh, can reduce the methane from landfills if they are recycled um, before they get into the into the, the, the into the landfill. Uh, what else? I think I think is that enough to we can send um, a, a summary of um, all the different types of ways to to offset to create these projects if that would be helpful. I can um, I can add to that by saying that um, uh, even though there are all these um, uh, great ways to um, create carbon offsets, um, uh, the inventory is not nearly um, enough to keep up with the um, uh, mushrooming demand. So the carbon price uh, may be something that you're interested in um, uh, tagging too early by buying credits um, against some um, your um, your footprint um, now uh, the uh, credits um, oh, well I think when they first opened this company those credits were selling for uh, three to five dollars a credit they went to eight then ten then fifteen um, our last contract sold them at twenty five dollars a credit and um, uh, but I can see that um, even now. Um, uh, the price of $60 of credit is very real and um, $100 of credit is being predicted. Um, uh, we're very uh, cautious about, um, about um, the enormity of um, uh, what could be out there to buy offsets um, uh, if really promoted aggressively. Um, when you think about the Fortune 500 companies uh, in just this country, it's a very small top of the pyramid, but that small to medium sized business like your own is much wider, much larger. And um, you can buy credits at this point for a very affordable price. Um, that price may go up um, soon. Uh, so what you do now may affect the price of what you will want to do later. And um, I would advise now than later because um, the price uh, at $100 is predicted by maybe next year, early next year. Um, and um, uh, a, um, a blockchain auction is being um, uh, organized so that those sales could be um, articulated to anybody. Um, I can say that there have been some tests uh, through Shell uh, in Holland so that um, they can offset um, your gas purchase at the pump when you're buying it so mm -hmm. that you choose you can offset it right then right there with a, a, a um, an increase in the price so that you're buying the credit from shell that they purchased from us uh, but it's um, really taking traction I can see the same thing happening in this country as people begin to take individual uh, responsibility for their own footprint what they're doing um, and it, it's going to be that large uh, in the end. It's going to have to be that large to tackle the, um, the climate change question as quickly as we need to. 
So that's great. So it's uh, Robert's uh, response is uh, speaking to um, the next couple of questions. Um, I, I don't see a name. I just see the numbers 94412. Uh, but their second question in the chat box is, uh, I'll take that easy one first, which is how do you specifically purchase renewable energy versus regular energy from a utility? So in our case, we we just call Madison Gas and Electric. They have a kind of a division that works with small businesses. And you can simply, in our case, we just indicated we would like to purchase 100% renewable energy. They make that designation in our account. And what it effectively looks like to us is our energy bill is simply greater. And for us, we have about 4,300 square feet. So it represents about an additional $1,500 in cost for the whole year for that renewable energy. And again, just to put that in proportion of our total carbon footprint, by using renewable electricity, we reduce our carbon footprint by 83% just by that action. And then the other question on, in the chat box is trying is asking about the flow of dollars. So I can maybe just speak to it in my own case, and then maybe Robert and Olivia can speak to it in the larger carbon credit markets. But effectively, what it looked like for us is carbon credit capital came back and they said, Artisan, you have basically another 12 metric tons of carbon to offset. That's going to cost you X dollars. In our case, I think it was $280. So for a practice of our size, 4,300 square feet, nine operatories, our cost to be completely carbon neutral over a full year is about plus or minus $2,000. And we feel that the marketing value, the brand and goodwill value more than eclipses that cost. So I'll pause there and, and uh, maybe, uh, uh, Robert and Olivia can speak to other flows of money through the system. Or if nine nine, or sorry, nine four four one two would like to ask a follow up question to clarify, please do that. I think um, you can see that your offset cost is um, uh, is laudable and um, but but pretty affordable. Uh, think of the value of that marketing message to let the world know that um, that you really are doing what you what you can and should do. Um, now, uh, linking arms with all of the other dental practices out there that could, in fact, offset their own footprint in the same way. Now you now you've got a real power, uh, and um, and the industry has not spent a great deal. But it lets um, their customers know that you're uh, working for them and all the other stakeholders that you mentioned. Um, that this is uh, what we will all have to do in our respective businesses, no matter what we're doing. And we're just going to have to wrestle with how do we deal with this? Yeah. Olivia, did you want to speak more to that? And then I know that uh, Sarah has an additional follow up question. I think that. Um... Robert's idea of um, sort of almost creating a group to purchase offsets on behalf of a number of dental practices is sounds like a like an economical way to go here. Um, so that's that's about all I have to contribute. I I look forward to the next question. So uh, Sarah was uh, asking a very good question, which is, does Artisan need to continually buy credits each year? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, the opportunity, uh, and as Robert is sort of speaking to, the, the carbon market is like any other market, it's dynamic. Um, so potentially our cost could increase. The other opportunity set here for businesses is they can work at reducing their total energy usage through things like, let's say, a better insulated building. Maybe they have more energy efficient appliances. Uh, another great idea, which we haven't touched on much, but I'm seeing, um, I know at least one practice in Madison, they have solar panels across their whole roof. 
So that's a great way to significantly reduce your carbon footprint um, and kind of fix your costs. Um, and there's great subsidies out there now from the federal government to purchase solar. Yes, panels. there are. But a good question, Sarah. Yeah. So Scott, um, maybe you'll make sure that um, that people have our our emails. So if other questions come up, then then we can that we can receive an email to answer. No, I think that's great, Olivia. And and yes, for those who are interested. Um, you can see the respective emails of myself, Olivia, and Robert on the screen here. And again, uh, once we kind of edit this film, I'll post this film to the Artists and Dental YouTube channel, and then the Wisconsin Dental Association will also have it posted. Um, so feel free to reach out to us with any additional uh, follow-up questions that you have. Um, so there's another question in the chat box, which is a good one for Robert or Olivia, and that is, is there a tax advantage or deduction for credits purchased? No, not that I'm, not that I'm aware of. I don't know of one either. Uh, there is a, obviously a talk of a, a carbon tax on those that continue to, um, to, um, Put emissions in the air and um, uh, and using that tax as a subsidy to help fund those carbon reduction or removal efforts that are out there and need um, need the support to find um, uh, true footing. Um, but there is no tax advantage that, that I'm aware of. Um, uh, but um, it is a, a market, like I said, that it, that you should participate in now. And nothing says that you can't. Um, buy enough credits, uh, Scott, for the next five years, based on the uh, accelerated pace of the of the value, and um, because it will be there, and um, and you may have to pay that then than than now, um, and you may rather pay the price today. Yeah, I, I actually appreciate you forecasting what the market's doing, Robert, because that's what I was actually thinking. <laughs> well, um, nothing. I mean, it's a market. Um, and um, and nobody uh, ha has a um, a crystal ball, but um, if you can just imagine the enormous population that is now really concerned because it affected them this summer. I, I had a tree down in my yard. Uh, people down the road were flooded out. Um, the fires, the drought. It just it is now at your doorstep. And if you didn't believe that it was real. Uh, before you, you certainly have got a, a big indicator that it is, and that, and most people are trying to take this very seriously and do what they can. You've gone uh, above and beyond, Scott, and I think applause for you uh, in yes. uh, in leading the way and being the first. And um, uh, I think that's um, intelligent and um, yes. responsible, and um, uh, in every way as a business owner. So applause to you and others that follow you. Well, thank you. And um, I hope that the whole program was beneficial for everyone. Um, and please um, reach out to us with questions that you may have. And we would also welcome your feedback in general about how the program could improve. Our larger sort of vision is that um, the program is well received um, by people such that um, we would have a strong case to then approach other state dental associations national dental associations and you know james uh, you already have uh ce programming and a webinar that perhaps you know you could create a, a separate carbon neutral webinar that could be offered globally but you know effectively what we want to get the message out so if you have positive feedback as well we would welcome that and uh, feel free to share that with the, the wisconsin dental association as well um, but if there aren't any other uh questions uh, I, th I think I, I see one more question maybe in the chat box.
So the question is, uh, are you not pricing yourself out of business as these credits increase exponentially? Uh, you are relying on goodwill, correct? Um, my, my own particular sense is that um, with the ability to markedly reduce one's carbon simply by switching to renewable energy with your utility or purchasing what are called renewable energy credits, and those are basically an option if your utility doesn't offer renewable energy, which most do, you can purchase these renewable energy credits, which are effectively the same. So I think, again, in our case, we were able to drop our carbon by 83% just purchasing renewable energy. I think the incremental cost to buy carbon offset credits uh, will not be that significant because we only had to offset 12 metric tons, which is about $280 a year. Um, so we feel that the, the return on investment, if you will, from a marketing branding perspective um, is actually excellent in light of just that cost. So super, I don't see any other questions. Um, so other than that, have a great uh, holiday season. Yes, have a good holiday, everybody. Thanks right, for hosting. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, Scott. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Bye now. Bye.